Anyway, that okay. was fun, and we've got Mark in Austin, Mark in Texas. Austin, who is local. We'll start with local fellow. Good. Hello. There you are. Mark. Hi. I, I have a lot of experience with theology and the academic side of Christianity, so okay. I thought I would call in and have a polite debate with you. That's fantastic. Uh, where uh, you, uh, I'm seeing on the board here, are uh, calling on behalf of your church? A lot of the youth at my church have been watching your program. <laughs> um, thank Bye. you. And while myself and the parents find it amusing, we are worried that the youth are being tricked and deceived by our program. Oh, oh dear. Well, um, we don't. I think you're do on that. to us. Uh oh. Yeah. No, also, seriously. My I congregation mean... is watching, so please be polite. Last time, okay. someone from our congregation called. Your host Jeff was uh, wild. Je <laughs> Jeff can be a bit of a firebrand. I'll admit that. Uh, you're going to need to. We're feeding it. back. We've got some feedback. Yeah, you're, you're, if you're watching okay. on your television while you're We've talking We've been to having us. some problems with uh, with studio stuff for the last few weeks, okay. so... Um, because also, be, if, you're watching, if you're watching the program and you have your television turned up, sometimes that will feed back into the phone also. Okay. So you don't want to do that. Well, um, anyway... You know, well, the, the rule of this program is that you get what you give. So, you know, um, we're all about having polite discussions. Yeah, so, you know, it, but it works both ways, so... And so, uh, have you mentioned what, what your church is? Mark, Pardon, still, I can't hear you very well. Oh, okay. Uh, have you mentioned what your church is? Would you like to plug them? My church is the Austin Stone. Um, okay. And, um, Hi, Austin Stone. Go on. We are a New Testament church. Okay. Okay, so well, what's your question? Or what would you like to talk about Well, today? my question um, is, first of all, um, is it true that on your show, um, you made um, a comparison between God and Bigfoot. Oh, very likely, yes. Yeah, we quite possibly have done that, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, um, it is true there is no Bigfoot, um, because there simply are no transitional forms. No. Uh, there, there is a, a ten thousand dollar cash prize for anyone who presents a transitional form to um, yeah, but to, I, to I Ray, think Ray Comfort. I, I think you're, <laughs> Ray oh, Comfort. Oh, you're you're one of this batch. All right, right. Okay. Um, I think you'll find that the reason that we brought up Bigfoot is because people frequently ask us, why don't you believe in God, and uh, and can you prove that there's no God, and. The kind of response that we usually uh, that we usually throw out there is it doesn't have to be Bigfoot. It could be leprechauns or fairies or unicorns. But the question is, mm -hmm. do you believe you don't believe in Bigfoot? But can you prove that there's no Bigfoot? Well, I, I think you are correct that Bigfoot is not real. However, God is real. Right, but you can't prove that Bigfoot doesn't exist. That is probably the point that somebody was trying to make by bringing it up earlier. Yes. Um. So, okay. what we're saying, I, I'm sorry, uh, I should draw these lines a little better. When we say, when we say that uh, we're atheists and we don't believe that God exists, the point that we're making is that in order to demonstrate that something like a God exists, um, the burden of proof rests on the person making the claim. So if you wanted to make me believe that Bigfoot exists, you would have to find, you would have to first present some pretty convincing reasons why you would believe in Bigfoot. Now, you don't believe in Bigfoot. Um, you do believe in this uh, omnipotent presence in the universe. And all we like to say is basically, you know, how do you know? What kind of evidence would you have about that? Now, this is where you start to lose your credibility with people okay. who have watched uh, the program before. Well, I'm uh, sorry because, about that. Because Matt Slick already did a proof for God. 
Yeah, and uh, we you just... might remember it from the episode he called in and embarrassed Matt Dillahunty, your organization's <laughs> That's, oh, that's really funny. not how we saw it. Actually, yeah. what, what's interesting is that after that episode happened, he went back and changed the, uh, the web page where he was making that argument because uh, Matt demonstrated that uh, his argument didn't work. Right, right. Well, because the point is, is that you can take, you could take Matt's, mm -hmm. I wasn't on that actual program, but we watched it. Uh, you I could mean, take Matt Slick, Matt, yeah, you could take yeah. Matt Slick's entire, uh, we've, we're familiar with the transitional argument for God, and there was that whole uh, program about it. The problem with it, as Matt Slick presents it on the CARM website, is that you can take his entire argument word for word, right? Every single one of his points, as it's outlined. And... Even if you were to grant him, for the sake of argument, every one of his premises, although um, on that program we pointed out where some of the, uh, Matt pointed out, Matt Dillahunty pointed out where some of the premises were flawed, even if you took his entire argument as written and said, all right, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, you get right down to his conclusion at the very bottom where he says, uh, and we call this creative force or whatever, we call this thing God, right? When you get to his conclusion, you can take his entire argument, you can replace the word God in the conclusion with Zeus, with the flying spaghetti monster, with any mythical being that you care to dream up. And the argument works just as well. All right? You can, you can, you can take his entire argument as worded and come up with the same conclusion, and we call this being the invisible magic space pixie. And the, and the argument works just as well. So that essentially is why the argument failed and what well, Matt, Sli I, I, and what Matt think, Slick did was I, I think that Matt Slick's point was that um, everything is physical or conceptual so so, so, so absolutely but do you agree with me that you can not physical but do so you agree with me that you can do that with his argument and that means they are concept in God's mind well how so, do you how do you distinguish uh, God's well first off how do you distinguish God's mind as a thing that actually exists well that is how you how you prove that um, God's mind exists? But I just, but as and I just the, explained the to you, the evidence from the Bible will uh, prove that the Christian God exists. But the, the, what I what I just what I just brought up, right, was that the transcendental argument for God, as Matt Slick had written on the CARM website, in its exact wording, you can re replace the word God with the name of any mythological being that you choose, and the argument works just the same. And you didn't disagree with me when I said that, so do, shall I take that as agreement that the argument works just well as the transcendental argument for anything? It proves that there's a mind. Well, well, how does it, okay, well, how does it even on. prove... Can I, can I change well, ta track? I'm right. sorry. No, I'm just, well, I, I just want to say, but you agree then that the argument can be used just as well to prove, prove... Any, any mythological being as well as God. Am I right or am I wrong when I suggest that? It proves there is some God, then the Bible proves the God is the Christian God. Well, how do you get from the wording of that argument to the Bible? I mean, where's the link from that argument to the Bible? Because again, you could say, again, you could take the argument, as I've just suggested, replace God with Zeus, right? And then you could say, the argument proves that there is a God, and then Greek mythology proves that that God is Zeus. See, what you're saying to me is exactly Greek the same thing. Greek mythology did not have eyewitnesses. Well, I mean, as far no. as we know, anyone who wrote as the Bible, I mean, you yeah. know, that came like 30 years later. But I'd also like to go back to one of the premises you were talking about earlier. You said that everything is, uh, I'm sorry, remind me of the wording, everything is either physical or conceptual, right? Right? Can you hear me? Mark, can you hear Russell? Mark. Are you there? Hello? I'm not... I'm not hearing Mark yeah, anymore. Yeah, control room, did we, did we lose Mark? Okay. Oh. All right. Hang on. We're sorry about this. The, uh, okay, technical problems. Um, also, earlier on, uh, in, in, in terms of comparing God to Bigfoot while we're waiting to get whatever issue is, 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 is a problem right now. Um, we're going to put you on hold, Mark, and we're going to try again in two minutes. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Um, well, 
Bigfoot well, God Loch Ness Monster. I want to finish what I was saying, actually. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, I, I mean, the premise of this transcendental argument is that uh, everything is either physical or conceptual. And the idea is that uh, if... Uh, if these things are to exist, then the conceptual stuff must be held in the mind of something called a god uh, uh, unless there are human minds to conceive of it. So my question, and, and I think the approach that Matt took when Matt Slick called was, which one is God? Is God physical or is God conceptual? Because uh, if God is one of those or the other, then obviously the basic issue of the question has not gone away. It's just been transferred. Like, who's conceiving of God or where did the physicalness of God come from? Uh -huh. And if you say that God is neither physical nor conceptual... Then you have to then, identify. Then you've, you've undercut your own argument because by saying everything is physical or conceptual, then you're making a special exception to the rule that you say applies to everything. And right. once you acknowledge that there's stuff that is neither physical nor conceptual, then uh, the argument doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mark, we have no idea what happened to the audio on, yeah. on uh, getting you in here. So uh, um, we'd like to invite you maybe try, try hanging up and calling back. And no, if the, don't try don't that. Because well, that may let's work. Check we'll, a, yeah, we'll, but let's check if another caller works first. Uh, well, that, yeah, because that could be the case. Because again, the whole phone system. You know, as Sorry, you know, we folks, really we've had for several weeks. Having yeah. technical problems well, for a while. We'll see if we've got him back now. For uh, Okay. Give another shot to Mark. Are you there? We've got Mark in Austin. How are you? Hi, Matt. I'm glad I got, I'm glad I got to talk to you this time. I tried to get you last show, but you weren't on. Can can we uh, get that? There's it's like overly loud right here, so I don't know if I can. can you hear me? I can hear you. I had a difficulty understanding. You said, "Hey, they're going to turn this down, and we'll we'll try it one more time." Go ahead and talk, Mark. Can you hear me this time? Hello. Hello. Yeah, keep going. Okay, um, I am from a church, and hello. Hello. Now we lost him. Okay, you know, we lost him. You know, that's, that's curious because I haven't been able to catch up on the last two shows. Uh -huh. um, but evidently, last week there was some kind of disconnect, and there were people who thought that, you know, we hung up on them. There were other people who thought they hung up on us. I don't know what the disconnect was. Um, I, w I haven't seen the last two shows, but people are like, oh, you know, this Mark guy from what, Stone Church or whatever uh -huh. um, is likely to call back in, and I've been looking forward to actually talking to him. Uh, Mark, if we can't get the phones to work and you can't get back in, uh, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to come visit your church. I'm happy to sit down with you otherwise. We can, you know, certainly work something out. Um, and I apologize, although I don't seem to be having problems with other calls, so I'm not quite sure. Hey, Mark, you there? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I yeah, can. Yeah, we could before. We just okay, had... I'm sorry. And last time I called the show, that was um, a mistake on my part, too. No okay, worries. Um, We're just glad so, to get it sorted. So what's up? Well, um, I actually uh, go to church here in Austin, and uh, there's been a, a bit of a, a discussion uh, about your show lately at my church, and um, there's actually been a lot of concern um, because uh, I don't know uh, which church you guys uh, went to. Um, but uh, we're pretty, we're pretty much by the book, um, and uh, sure, I was I was primarily Southern Baptist. I went to a handful of Pentecostal churches from time to time, but almost exclusively Southern Baptist. Okay, and, and and what 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 did um, what did your church say about blasphemy? Um, I went to a number of different churches. I don't necessarily know that. I, I don't know that, that blasphemy was specifically discussed in a way that I remember. I understand that, you know, it's, it's a sin and that apostasy being the potentially unforgivable sin and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, blasphemy was wrong. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, if, if, uh, if, 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 if when you were at church, if there was a show like, um, like your show, what would you have thought about it, do you think? You know, I thought about that a lot, and, I, and I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, because I can no longer view this show through the lens that I used, that I would have once viewed it through. I can, I can do a pretty decent job of, of thinking about how I might have looked at it. Um, I probably would have been um, concerned about the effect that it might be having on people. I mean, my parents 
think that I'm working for Satan, leading people to hell. Um, so, you know, I can kind of use their, their assessment mm. as a barometer. Mm. And I would have been concerned for the souls of the individuals on the show, um, you know, for fear that, that they would be lost to hell as well. Well, that's just a perfect answer. Um, my church believes heaven and hell are real places. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And uh, guess which one you're going to if you keep this up? Oh, dude. Well, uh, just, just, see, here we go. Just, this why why do you want to be our enemy? I mean, why do you on on purpose choose to think bad things about us? What's wrong I'm, with you? It, I'm sorry. You know, uh, it, the Bible it, to is, be a, is really clear Never mind the freaking about... Bible. The, 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 it, do you want to be a person who can get along well with others or not? Or do you want to you know, partition yourself off into some little subgroup where if people aren't in that group with you, then they're bad? What's wrong with you? Why, 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 why is this appealing? You want to you wanna believe that me and Matt, who are not hurting anybody but just stating our opinion on TV, that we deserve to be tortured forever? That's what you want? <laughs> Cut it out. Just relax. We're, we're a New Testament church, and, and the book is pretty clear about... Sure. Well, there's your mistake. What? Why? Okay, I, I understand your position. I, I understand that you believe this, and you believe it because the Bible says so. Why should anybody else believe it? I mean, well, uh, I, mean I, I guess and, that's and, the reason I called, really, is, is to um, defend the faith. And the Bible says you should defend the faith. <laughs> and, uh, I, 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 I understand that, you know, First Peter 3.15, I got you. We're on the same page there. I understand what the book says. What I asked was why anybody else should believe it. Because the reason that I'm no longer a Christian is because I finally came to the understanding that my beliefs were without rational justification and without evidentiary support. So... Now, and, I, and I'll go a step further, further, that even if the Bible were true, even if it were, and I don't for a second think it is, and nobody has yet been able to come close to demonstrating that it's true, um, that still does not put one in a position where they are worshiping out of anything but fear of a monster that is grotesque and wants to punish people for its own problems. Now, setting aside all that, why should anybody believe what you believe? There are a million different reasons give to us believe your best one. not just yeah, that just God us, is real, but that Christianity is the one. only way to God. Just sure. give us your best reason. What's the best reason? <sighs> well, um, it's, it's sort of, what, what exactly, uh, what exactly am, I trying, am I trying to demonstrate here? Uh, just that... Uh, why are you a Christian? What is the main reason why you are a Christian? <sighs> well, um... There's a lot of evidence that the Bible was divinely inspired. Such as? So, yeah. Um, there is prophecy. No, no, such as. So, what, what is, where, where is, give us a piece of evidence that shows that the Bible is divinely inspired. Okay, um, the Bible says things about, about, um, about nature that uh, weren't widely known at the time. How do you know? And, and what, like, give me an example, first of all. Well... Because we're talking kind of about example, we're, we're talking about a book. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh no. Uh, uh, first of all, Matt Slick's called in. Um, the nonsense at Carm.org has been refuted. I don't know how many times. But we're talking about a book that, if you actually take it literally, do you think the world is six to ten thousand years old? Well, um, there's a lot of interpretation. That's, that's an um, easy yes or no question. Do you think the world is closer to six to ten thousand years old, or closer to three point five billion years old? Well, um, I guess if you if you um, if you take it literally, yeah, the world is uh, closer to six to ten thousand years old. Matt asked you specifically what you believe, because we're you know, we're trying to get at well, what is the main reason why you're a Christian, and you're dancing all around. Why can't you tell us? If you if you listen if you listen back to the way you just answered the to that or tried to answer or actually tried to avoid answering that last question, all I was asking was what you think, and we were going to go from there. But I, I'm I'm happy enough with your answer that yes, a literal view would make it six to 10,000 years old. So clearly either you think it's six to 10,000 years old or you're not completely a literalist. Um, but irrespective of what your position is, do you at least acknowledge that all of the scientific evidence points to an earth that is vastly older than six to 10,000 years old? 
Yeah, I'm aware of that. Okay. So how do you reconcile... It doesn't prove there's no God. You're me. right. You're right. Did I say it did? I'm not saying that that proves there's no God. What I'm saying is, here's something we've learned about the universe, and it doesn't match with your literal view of the Bible. Now, there's a conflict there, and we need to resolve that. And some people resolve it in favor of the Bible, saying the Bible's absolutely right, and ignore whatever actual evidence is presented there. Um, I find that to be patently absurd because it, it turns Christianity into a self-contradictory proposition, which is, and so, by the way, does the entire idea of a revelation in the New Testament. Because your, posi your position, uh, to, to the extent that I understand it, because I haven't got a kind of a straight answer yet, is one where there is a God who has an important message for mankind, and somehow he only reveals it to certain individuals who then write this down, and thousands of years after this initial revelation, we have to rely on copies of copies of translations of copies by anonymous authors with no originals, and the a textual testimony to a miracle, for example, the loaves and fishes, there's no amount of reports, anecdotal testimonial reports, that could be sufficient to justify believing that this event actually happened as reported. No amount. And anything that would qualify as a god would clearly understand this, and if it wanted to convey this information to people in a way that was believable, would not be relying on text to do so. And this, for me, is the nail in the coffin for Christianity. You, the, 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 God that, the God that Christians believe in is amazingly stupid if it wants to actually achieve its goal of spreading this information to humanity by relying on text, by relying on languages that die off, by relying on anecdotal testimony. That's not a pathway to truth. And anything that would qualify for a God should know this, which means either that God doesn't exist or it doesn't care enough about those people who understand the nature of evidence to actually present it. Now, which of those possibilities do you think is, is accurate? I think you, you do need faith to believe it. Sure. And but that, why would you believe anything on faith? Faith isn't a pathway to truth. Everybody's, every religion has some sort of faith. People take things on, you know, if faith is your pathway, you can't distinguish between Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, any of these others. How, how, how is it that you use reason as a path to truth in every endeavor of your life, and then when it comes to the ultimate truth, the most important truth, you're saying that faith is required? And how does that reflect on a God who supposedly exists and wants you to have this information? What kind of God requires faith instead of evidence? Well, I think you probably have faith about a lot of things, too. Like what? I have, I, don't, I have reasonable expectations based on evidence. I have trust that has been earned. I will grant trust tentatively. I don't have faith. Faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have evidence. I mean, if you can come up with something that I believe that I don't have evidence for, guess what I'll do? I'll stop believing it. That's the nature of a rational mind. That is, the, that is the goal. My only goal was to be the best Christian I could be and represent this to people who didn't believe. And what I found, because I actually cared about whether or not my beliefs were true rather than whether they felt good, was that my beliefs weren't justified. Try as I might and pray as hard as I could. No answer comes. No evidence is forthcoming. And when I talk to people about this, the only answer they ever offer is the one you did which is, well, you just got to have faith. Well, sorry, I don't. And not only do, well, I'm not sorry that I don't, I'm sorry for others that they think that, that I should have, because faith is not a virtue. Faith is gullibility. It's yeah. evidence that determines whether or not your perception of reality is reasonable and in conjunction with the world as it is. Well, I think uh, church gives a lot of people uh, some community and some values. Sure. So what? That has no tie to the, the truth of the supernatural claims. Church religions and churches have tons and tons of benefits for the in-group. And some of them even have benefits for some of the out-groups with, you know, feeding the homeless. Although I really wish, as many of the atheists do, we have the atheists helping the homeless group in Austin, where we will actually help the homeless without making them sit through a sermon first. Um, you know, it's, we're not holding their sandwich ransom in the name of Jesus. 
that you can do, there's no good thing that a church or religion does that cannot be achieved by purely secular means. And there's no benefit, positive benefit, of churches and religions that necessarily demonstrates the truth of their supernatural claims. But there, but there is, and this is my personal hobby horse today, there is a cost to deciding that you're going to take, uh, um, um, in particular, Christianity on faith. And that is that when you run into folks like us who don't believe it, you are compelled, because you have decided to believe Christianity, you are compelled to think all kinds of horrific things about us and, 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 and tell us that, uh, or come at us with these threats of eternal torment, um, which just draws a, you know, an insurmountable line between us. Yeah, or we, cannot be, we cannot be friends because of what you have decided to take on faith. That's the cost. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, that, that divisive cost um, plays out not only in the previous caller who had to give up his job because of good-intentioned Christians, but I have a fiancé sitting in the room um, who is essentially estranged from a good portion of her family who consider me to be the devil. Now, I may not be a perfect person, far from it, but I'm generally a good person and a caring person, and I do whatever I can to live the best life I can. I certainly am not, uh, well, I, I guess if I was the devil, this is exactly what he would say, um, so who knows. Uh, but the absurdity of the divisive nature of Christianity in particular, and by the way, I'm an atheist with regard to all gods, uh, but since you're kind of representing Christianity, it, it just, I mean, it breaks my heart. People who actually understand what love is, people who actually understand what morality is, people who actually understand reality, it, it, it is almost unbearable to watch the people that you love be so absolutely duped into a divisive, hateful religion that they think is not divisive, they think it's inclusive, and they think it's positive. It, it kills me, and it's one of the reasons that I do this. Because I, for 25 plus years, believed this stuff. I am so happy, so happy, that I no longer think that my former roommate is destined for hell. I am so happy that despite the fact that my relationship with my parents, the nature of it has changed, I don't have to worry about them. The division is entirely one-sided. I didn't end relationships when I became an atheist. Christians ended those relationships, and it was because their particular religion cannot tolerate. My, my, I, was, I had letters from people who said, we can no longer associate with you. You are of the devil. Now, it's possible that they're right. It's possible. I don't know, I don't know under what circumstances. But the only way that you could demonstrate that is with reason and evidence, and not faith. And I don't know how we can fix a world where people have been so convinced that they are doing the right thing out of compassion and love and trying to help people when it is absolute poison, when it is absolutely destructive. I, I wish everybody could go through what I went through so they could have a, a proper understanding of, wow, how the heck could I have believed those things that I believed? And how much better life is when you want to deal with reality on reality's terms. I mean, I know that we didn't give you a huge lot of opportunity to, to express your views, but every time I asked, I got kind of a dance. And I'm, I'm happy to have you call back in, but if your whole position is that the foundation of your belief is necessarily dependent on faith, then we got nothing to talk about. Because I don't think that that's a good thing, and until you demonstrate that faith is a good thing, how could you possibly convince somebody? And, and by the way, how do you go about demonstrating that faith is a good thing without evidence? It all comes back to reason and evidence. I think he's gone again. All right. I was going to give him the last word. 